Hello and welcome back to another Red Jacks on podcast with me, Fraser. Me, Charlie. And not Rikesh, because Rikesh is alive now. Fuck that guy. But uh, <laughs> he's working. Uh, with me, uh, Sohan. And this week, uh, we're doing a little mini topic and we're calling it Have You Guys Watched? I think that's what I said it was going to be called. <laughs> <laughs> Insert title here. Insert title here. Yeah, what have what we watched? What have we watched? Have you guys watched? And we're just going to bring either a movie or a show uh, that we may have watched before that we just want to talk about, um, whether it's good or bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, should I start? Yeah. I want to ask something quickly. Sorry. I'll Go for it. I'll get myself. What was it on in school on the carpet? when you Was it like Showtime? Show and tell. Show and tell. And tell. We call it show and tell. Yeah. I think, yeah. It was show and tell, right? You'd bring like a toy or a book or a game or whatever. And be like, this is what I did. This is what I have in my life today. Yeah, maybe we should call it show and tell. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> show a show and tell. Oh, you popped it. <laughs> show a show and tell. Nice. I can't, I can't ever remember having anything to show or tell in school. <laughs> it was always something shit like I drew a picture of a goldfish. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow, Tony, well done. <laughs> right, so have you guys watched In Time? Oh, uh, just Timberlake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, I have. A while ago. A while ago. <laughs> It's a little uh, little cult classic, although it didn't apparently it didn't get um, good reviews, but uh, I liked it. I liked what it did uh, with the concept. Mm. Yeah, so um, just a quick synopsis of what it's about. Um, so Justin Timberlake plays a plays a kid called Will Salas um, in a world where when you turn twenty five, you stay twenty five for the rest of your life, but uh, you have a timer on your on your on the inside of your forearm that ticks down. So when you turn twenty five, you get one year, and then all of the world's currency is in uh, hours and minutes. Can you hi- can you guys hear this dog? Yeah, yeah. Fuck, fucking, <laughs> honestly, always going off. Mate, he's just passionate. He's he's a really big fan of in time. <laughs> Neighbours don't even have a dog. I don't know why they have it. <laughs> it's just the neighbour in the garden going, row, row. Is he podcasting again, that little bastard? <laughs> give him something to podcast about. Okay, there we go. Shoot, My dog's here. He's, he's nice and quiet. Oh, he's a good boy. Um, so, yeah, you are living in a world where uh, time is currency. Um, and you basically you can live day to day, minute to minute, hour to hour. Um, and it's about Will Sellers, uh, and he comes across a guy called Henry Hamilton, who is from one of the more affluent districts where they have hundreds of years on their clocks. Um, he's, I think he said he lived for about 80 years or something like that. And he's had enough, um, no, it was 105 years, I think it was. Um, so he came down to the poor district where Will, where Will is from um, and was basically just buying drinks and looking to get rid of it all. Um, when these guys called the Minutemen show up, which are basically a gang who go mm. around sort of policing the money, uh, policing the time in their own way, uh, he saves him from them. And when they stay overnight in some kind of factory, he gives him all his time, so he ends up with Will ends up with like a hundred hours, uh, and the guy basically commits suicide. Um, Is it a hundred hours or years? A hundred years, so yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. Um, and so obviously, Will has all these plans. He he goes to his best friend, gives him ten years. Uh, he's obviously going to go. He, he goes to meet his mum. Uh, who's that's a that's a weird dynamic. Can you imagine <laughs> living with your mum? She's still twenty five. <laughs> yeah, and she's actually fifty. Uh, that uh, was the like, one of the weirdest things yeah. ever. Brain couldn't 
compute like by the the, the the laws of the film was like it makes sense they look that way but mm. they're like other son but i'm like you look like a couple my brain couldn't it couldn't put her in a mother role i just like are they gonna fall in love yeah. i'm like she's 50 and, and his mom okay this is there's, weird there's a later scene yeah. in the film as well where he's in the rich place and he meets this guy and he says here's my grandmother here's my wife and here's my daughter and it's yeah. just all these really young women yeah. it's really strange um but uh yeah fun fact that i, that I learned that um the woman who plays his mother which is oliver wilde olivia yeah. wilde Beautiful um she's actually three years younger than justin tim blake in that film oh wow well, there you go yeah it makes sense though i mean that's <laughs> the sense. the dynamic of that of that universe mm-hmm. did they actually explain how they get the time on their forearms no they didn't it's just mm-hmm. a thing at birth that they do somehow so the clock stays at zero or something or, or i think it stays at one year while um, while you're growing up and then once it hits 25 it kind of just ticks in and from the way it looks in the film it looks like it kind of like gives you a mini heart attack it's like a shudder yeah, yeah. Because there's that scene where he's running towards his mum to catch her in time. When her timer goes off, she just mm-hmm. immediately collapses. He catches her, and it's like that. You know, God forbid, I don't really know it, but like that heart attack moment of like there's just seconds or minutes, and then she's gone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think it's Imagine like, just having like an hour left on your clock and being like, "But boss, I've really got to go. I've got an hour until I die. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I've got to get home." <laughs> well, those those first few like scenes in the film are like really deep because they're they're showing how all the prices are going up as well. Mm. So literally, his, her, his mum would have gotten the bus, um, and she had an hour and a half, and she goes to put her hand under the thing, and the and the, the bus driver goes two hours, and she quickly pulls it back. Um, can you imagine? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Put yourself in debt. Isn't it? Like, what do you, you owe Definitely. them? A, you owe them half an hour. How yeah. does that work? Do they transport your your dead body <laughs> into another bus driver? Yeah. <laughs> you owe us half an hour. Uh, into the zombie now. Mostly, they'd be like, she's going to work overtime. <laughs> overtime. Just they they didn't explore that concept actually. Overtime. Because <laughs> um. I don't remember watching the movie because looking at it now, it was 2011. I watched that in the cinema unreleased. You watched it in the cinema? Oh, wow. Yeah, I watched it in the cinema. I think I went and watched it with my uncle. Uh, I watched it with someone. I thought it might have been you, Sohan, but if you watched it with your uncle, maybe I uh, I've only watched it once in the cinema. Yeah. I think the only thing I really remember, not one of the only scenes, but one of the things that kind of stood out to me was when he goes to the kind of rich side and he's inherited that 100 years, and he's kind of mingling with the rich people and just the concept of time in which obviously I know it's about time itself, but the whole reflection of economy, finance, how it makes you live and think of life. And he's yeah. kind of like almost running to places and he's like, oh, no, wait, I don't have to run. Yeah. And even some mm-hmm. a little bit like, you're not really from around here. And I just thought it was a really nice, interesting reflection of sort of how we do kind of live our lives to a certain extent, depending on your financial status, you know, or, or, you know, feeling like if I'm living paycheck to paycheck versus I know I've got the, I've bought my house out, I've got the next 10 years worth of money. How would you perceive to move forward? Um, but yeah, I, I think the concept of this was way more interesting and practical than the film itself. No offense. Yeah. It was a bit forgettable. But I'm really glad you mentioned it, right? Yeah. I think a, a lot of the reviews said the same thing. It's more about kind of the first part of the film when they introduce things like that and the little mannerisms like the people who have loads of time, they don't really check their wrist a lot yeah. and they don't run places and they don't drive fast um, and things like that. And then the rest of the film is pretty much... So once he meets the, the love interest, yeah, um, it's pretty much just them running around doing stuff, trying to get time and stuff. Yeah. and run away from i can't remember who the guys who, who are the actual police i can't remember what they're called um time cops probably yeah <laughs> <laughs> time cops in, uh, in scott pilgrim the what one the vegan police in scott pilgrim oh fucking hell yeah <laughs> <laughs> just vegan powers i remember in time being like such a because like, there was a there was a book and i remember reading the book in school 
because I oh. think, oh, I watched the film and then read the book. And the book was like really, really good. And it proper put you in that world. And like, it wasn't about the love story as much as it was about just surviving in that world. But the yeah. film was, I think obviously because it was Justin Timberlake or maybe they rewrote it like to kind of angle it at younger people or something. But yeah, I remember it kind of being like really good ideas, but it just didn't execute a good film. Mm. Out of my yeah. opinion, a bit, of course. Yeah. I also think it was one of those first films where I'm like, as I kind of started, my brain was like, okay, I'm watching Justin Timberlake. You know, I love the artist, love his music and his talent, but my brain was trying to detach from Justin Timberlake, and it did to a certain extent. I did watch the film, and I did believe him and his character. Um, I don't, I think I remember not really believing in the love story, or maybe their chemistry wasn't that great, or maybe Justin Timberlake's acting wasn't as sharp as I thought it would be. I remember that concept being quite a, a big deal at the time. Like, oh, this is a, a singer. Is he going to go into acting? Is it really going to, is the transition really going to be seamless? And to my knowledge, he hasn't really gone back to acting, right? Um, I think he was in another film, uh, but I don't know. I don't think he was like, he didn't stick around in acting, but I thought his performance was, was all right. Yeah. I did. Yeah. In that film. Was, yeah. He does a lot of voice acting, I think. Um, I think oh yeah, he does. Yeah. Now, don't see. Yeah, but you don't really see him much on TV, which is weird. Or movies. Mm. I remember seeing a lot on Simpsons. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the NSYNC episode was great. <laughs> oh my god! In the navy. <laughs> Join the navy. <laughs> I miss the Simpsons. Yeah, he used to be cool. Um, but yeah, I guess that's pretty much all I have to say on in time. Um, well, it's 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 interesting, actually, like the concept of it all. Because imagine if they did, because in real life they are actually trying to decode, you know, what makes us age and things like that. If they did crack it, and people start living longer or indefinitely you know, do they then make, actually make that a kind of currency? Because, um... If pe- um yeah, if, if people wanted to capitalise on it and the, the mm. powerful people of the world wanted to capitalise on immortality, that would definitely be the way to do it. I yeah. Don't be- know, I don't know, maybe in buying time in terms of such a direct currency, yeah. but it would almost be like, I mean, this is not the show I'm going to bring today, but it reminds me of, like, Orphan Carbon, where I, if you download your psyche, you buy the carbon or even read the book mm-hmm. uh, into like a piece of basically like a hard drive and you can be reborn into a clone of your own body or any other body and the quality and longevity of the body that you get uh, is only dependent on how much money you have and if you can't afford it you just die out and they might keep your hard drive or destroy it and if you're rich like some people you know they can be murdered a hundred times or die of old age a hundred times and they just get rebooted into a, a younger clone version of their body. I think it would be more like maybe not that sort of system of transferring your mind, per se, but maybe just more not buying time, but if you can afford to live like this 1% of people that we're now seeing that can, wow, they've 20, 30 years and they're still young. If you can afford it in one go, cool. If you can't, you're going to live a standard life and earn your money and just die like a normal human being that's how i would imagine it to be mm. it is a, fun, okay. a really fun concept i love i do love the idea of it oh, so yeah. you 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 imagine like the the medium of what it would be making you kind of immortal as the yeah being tight the driving force really, there just being really <laughs> tight don't i mean if you've got like a house must be worth like like 10 years or 15 years or something be like okay what can i get that's like less than a year <laughs> you know i don't want to take off less than a year of my life yeah. you know and so yeah you just i mean I, that's definitely how most people would live and it just really tight on time to try and save up as much as possible i didn't kind of believe the whole idea of you know the mum only having an hour and a half of time left it's like you would not live that fucking close to the edge i get that it was kind of showing the uh you know like how how money can fluctuate and you know how um times can get hard but I mean, if you've got an hour and a half left, you don't go to work. You just go, oh, fuck it. Like, I'm going to die in an hour and a half. I think she gave, like, two days on on a loan or something. She had a loan she was paying off. 
she paid off like two days or something. Um, oh yeah, the, the, the loan the, works that you end up paying more. So <laughs> 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 anyway. <laughs> the the time setting for the film is apparently twenty one sixty nine. Amazing. Nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I don't get it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, cool stuff. Who wants to go next? That was a nice. Go on, Sam. What you got? So, so okay. For starting, up, we've all brought two things, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. So the, one of the things I brought, and by brought, I mean the last minute Google because I remembered. And this was on the. There's been a couple of films I've watched uh, recently. But this one I really enjoyed. I'd love to watch with you guys or enthuse you to watch is Nicholas Cage's The Unbearable Weight of Mass. <sighs> I really want to watch it. Yeah, no, me too. Yeah, it it's yet. on my list. It is an awesome film. I'll be honest with you. I would love to watch it with you guys. It's such a chill film. It's not so big and amazing where it's like, if you don't, you're going to really miss out. But at the same time, it's like a low key film. I was like, it had it on my list. I thought, let me just watch it one day. Found it, streamed it. And I was like, oh my God, this is hilarious. So <laughs> this is a film kind of a semi like biopic slash parody of Nicolas Cage and his life. Um, and this kind of does, and weird enough, I actually listened to a Do Go On episode about his life, and this does reflect, at one point, Nicolas Cage got into so much debt that he was doing, like, any film he could to pay off his debt, which he oh, now shit. has, everything like that. Yeah, he went for a couple of years. Uh, and this is kind of, like I said, parodying and reflecting that time of his life where he's like, it's, the film kind of starts off with him talking to, like, uh, an agent or someone or a director, and it's like, ah, sorry, Cage, we're going to kind of go somewhere else. And Nicolas Cage is like, right, this is it. 100% in or, or I'm out. Like, I'm, bro- I'm not going to afford anything. And the guy's about to like, go to the car park and he just like, Nicolas Cage just stops and he becomes full Nicolas Cage and just starts monologuing this shit and like, giving his all that to be like, look how, look how much I've got to give. And the guy's like, no, no, still not. And it's about him kind of trying to balance out his insecurity, his, his finance, his debt, his ego. And with his family, where his wife, I think he's divorced in the film, and his daughter's like, listen, you're not really a dad. You're not really there. You're not really present. You're embarrassing me. You know, it's my birthday. You're, you're trying to play the piano and take all the attention. Like, just basically just get out of my life a little bit. And through all of this personal and professional mess, he gets a message from a, like, a billionaire tycoon. I can't remember where. Somewhere in South America. And it's basically Pedro Pascal. And Pedro Pascal is a massive Nicolas Cage fan. and it's about their dynamic and kind of Nicolas Cage being there, like, okay, I'm going to get the money, fuck it, fan, whatever. I'll just do what I got to do, show my face. And they become friends. But as he's about to kind of move towards this, uh, I think the FBI contacts Nicolas Cage. And it's basically like, listen, we think this guy is like in the cartel or in some sort of South- <laughs> mafia or something, you know, in dirty oh, money. Pablo. We're about to go in and, you know, you're going to be our informant. So as Nicolas Cage is trying to be like Nicolas Cage and trying to do all this thing, he's also trying to infiltrate this organization uh. too much. because It's not really spoilery. This is the general synopsis. Um, but there's just one scene that breaks me every time. It's so fucking funny. It's basically they both trip on acid. I think they drop acid or an E and they're both driving in the car and there's that meme of like Nicolas Cage like, his face is like, what the fuck? <laughs> Like, so happy driving down. And <laughs> yeah, it's about that. this paranoid trip where they're just walking through like the city, and nothing's <laughs> nothing at all. The music's so dramatic, and because they're tripping, they're like, I think that guy. Hello, is he following? There's just some odd guy sitting on a bench, like he's looking at us. Fucking follow us. Don't look suspicious. Fucking run, go, go, go! And they're like running through the city and fucking going mad. And there's a point a jump over some wall. And he's like, like Pedro Pascal's got Nicolas Cage's hand. They're both tripping at this point, like heavy. And he's like, oh my God, like I'm not going to make it. Like, don't <laughs> let me. He's like, oh, I'm never going to let you go, Pedro. And, blah. and like, they get so hyped and emotional. He's like, no, oh, don't worry. I'll let you go, Cage. I'll, I'll, I'll fend them off. It's so, it's so. I think that's the, that's the scene in the trailer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's the build up. Pedro Pascal and Nicolas <laughs> dynamic is electric, man. It's so funny. That's what it, makes me want to watch it, to be honest. That's the, it, yeah. If, they, if their chemistry and their acting like skill wasn't on par, um, it wouldn't have been as, a, as good as a film because it's, it's about them two and it's about 
their lives kind of changing with each other and then basically becoming sort of friends and what it means with the, the cartel and this, and the family, the finance. I won't go into it more than that, but it is such a fun, easy film to watch. Um, and yeah, that's what I wanted to bring to you today, man. I would love to watch it with you guys, but the unbearable weight of massive, massive talent. talent. Yeah, I, it's on my list, man. I mean, it was on Now TV, and then I said it. Not on my, I put it on my watch list, and then um, it got taken off. It's, it's on Netflix. Is it on Netflix now? Yeah, it's on Netflix that's now. Off. Okay, <laughs> all right. I might actually watch that tonight, to be honest. Yeah, I think that's where it really popped into my mind. It's on my list. Um, let me just double check it. Bum, 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 bum. Pretty sure it is. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure I saved it there because I watched another Nicolas Cage film recently called Mum and Dad. It's a oh my god, have you yeah. seen that on, on, yeah. on, on Netflix pop up? Terrible. It's um, yeah, <laughs> it's free jokes as well. Like, it's just being Nicolas Cage, <laughs> yeah, it's not one of his better films, but no, it's a, a film and it, yeah. it exists, <laughs> it exists. <laughs> <laughs> so, how about do not watch that film, mate. <laughs> Mum and Dad. There's one scene, and every person who watches it, it's hor- it's horrifying. It's when the, the the newborn comes out. Yeah. Oh, mate. Ugh, creeping out. That's horrible. Thank you for putting it. <laughs> I don't even know if we could say it on a podcast. I mean, it's kind of grim. <laughs> yeah, The Unbearable Weight. The unbearable weight. I mean, I, I don't know what more I can say about it. It's the fact that it's on Netflix. And I know it's on Amazon Prime. Go watch it. Don't waste any time. It is How such long an, is it? It is, my friend, one hour and 45. Uh, it's like 15 minutes too long. <laughs> that's what I was going to say. It's the perfect... Uh, I got an hour and a half in me, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I've only got uh, about an hour. <laughs> look at his four right? oh shit I'm dead <laughs> guys I've got one more podcast in me and that's all I got left <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah these podcasts are killing me man <laughs> podcasts with currency oh shit yeah. um, I did recently watch Renfield as well kind of going off the, the uh, Nicolas Cage tangent and no, I mean the film oh was yeah a, yeah the film oh the vampire good. one with um, what's his name in it from uh, Beast from the Next British one. guy, his name is Nicholas Holt. 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 Um, it's it's a fairly good film. I think there's too much kind of happening within it, but just you know the whole like community is Nicholas Cage a genius or just terrible as an actor? And I'm leaving <laughs> the fact that I think he's a genius. Like honestly, watching him in Renfield, he's it's like he was born to play fucking Dracula. <laughs> And it is so, he does it so well. Forget say what you want about the film, but his role and him and Nicholas Holt's dynamic is awesome because it's it's obviously Nicholas Holt like being basically the Igor, the Dracula, and wanting to kind of break away from this sort of hold he has over him. But it's rather than it necessarily just being about good and evil, it's more about like it goes into like the narcissistic, abusive relationship between two people. If you take away the supernatural stuff, but even like like Nicolas Cage and all this dr- dramatic flair, it, was, it looks like a very classic uh, Dracula sort of vibe, um, and it just basically makes him feel bad continuously. Like you know, you're you're the issue in this relationship, you're the problem, and that's why Nicolas Holt just keeps going back to him. It's a very narcissistic relationship, but hmm. yeah, I know this is not the film I brought, but Nicolas Cage, uh, for the sake of our bed and community, I think he's a genius. <laughs> I, I really think like he's him. Nicolas Cage. Yeah, yeah. Some days I think he's a genius, and other days I think he's absolutely lost the plot. But <laughs> that's what makes him him. We love him. Not the oh. bees. <laughs> Not the bees. This is the of Nicolas Cage. You were saying that no matter what all he did, however big or small, he always gave one hundred and ten percent, and. I, firstly, I believe that of all of him continuously. But secondly, I um, he said that apparently with the bees meme and thing uh, that at the time the director and him kind of was in on the joke, which I don't really believe. I think he mm. was just like one hundred percent cage. Um, 
But, I yeah. don't know. He might have been being silly, and then they actually ended up using that take. Like you actually yeah, don't know. He like, could have done five ten. He could have been goofing about on set, but then once it makes it in the film and it's premiered, it's like, oh fuck! I was goofing around on that take. Was that like mm -hmm. <laughs> are they serious? You know, maybe they did that. You don't know. I actually listened to a whole podcast on um, Nicolas Cage. Uh, do go on. That's what, I, that's what I said. That's the one I listened to. Oh, sorry, mate. I, I must have missed you. But yeah, <laughs> it's a podcast. Yeah, I would understand if you're not listening. <laughs> <laughs> I remember there was um, a film, right? I've just Googled it now, it came out in 2007. Um, and I'm going to end it here. But it was like. It's meant to bring two. <laughs> kind of, this is the Nicholas this is third one. in a row. Fraser <laughs> <laughs> done one, you done three. <laughs> this is okay. pizza all uh, over again, sir. Had. So, yeah, I know. I know. I've had too many. I've had too many slices. I'm really sorry. <laughs> I'm still going to take it. Uh, have you guys ever watched the film next? Next. next it's just called next Nicolas Cage yeah, yeah, yeah I used to fucking love that film yes I don't think I have you know yeah. it's such a it's, it's a good. 2007 film it's so under the radar it was mm. I was when the site for you buy like copy DVDs and I bought a bunch and I was like what's next uh, it's not like push it's it's the next thing after push just oh. is push what is push well, I should have brought that film that's so what is, I should have done I had so is, <laughs> next is what's next after push yeah, he pushes himself to get next to go um, next. Don't mean all pushes. So yeah. next, that's yeah, that's the uh, the one where you can see like uh, like thirty <laughs> seconds or so into the future. Isn't it? Such a, again, such a good concept. Uh, he doesn't go full Cage in it, but uh, it, I think it was around that era where Cage was like, I'll just take almost any film and see what's a hit. Mm. It is crazy. The plot so, twist, uh, yeah, sick. Uh, I'm I was really like, oh wow, I, I did not I, see that kind of, like coming. I'm not going to go any more deeper than that. Uh, I'll. I'll so Charlie, what did you bring today? Oh, thank you, Sir Han, for passing the baton. Finally, <laughs> <laughs> I've <laughs> sitting on my IMDb page for about half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> I'd locked his phone like five times. Yeah, like I oh, fucking know, just sitting here swiping up and down. There was <laughs> when this thing was happening. I really want to talk about it. Show and tell. I was going to talk about next. Um, so, <laughs> um, I actually watched a film the other night. Me and Jay watched a film uh, called The Mitchells vs. the Machines. Have you guys seen it? Oh, uh, yeah, that's an animated. Yeah, it's Ooh. like um, it's got a bit of a, like a Spider Verse kind of animation to it. Like it's kind of like co um, comic mixed with with uh, CG or like that's just um, 3D animation. But it's a really fucking good watch. Like I I've watched it twice since I watched it the other day. I thought I would tell you guys about it. I mean, I was hoping one of you might have seen it, but I've seen I've seen like the end scene. I've caught like my my mum and my sister watching it. Oh, okay. I'll be honest. The comedy in it had me actually laughing out loud. I was on my own when I watched it the first time, and then I watched it again with Jade because I was like, no, nah, we've got to watch it together. But I was literally laughing out loud. It was. It's just got so many funny names in it, like you know, Danny McBride. Um, Who's in like this is the end? Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He's in it. The girl who voices Bean from Disenchantment. Mm -hmm. She's the main girl. You got Maya Rudolph who does um, uh, Bridesmaids and uh, Big Mouth. Like just all these big yeah. comedy actors. Olivia Coleman's in it as the as the bad one. And yeah, it, mate, it was just genuinely just a really 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 good romp. I enjoyed it so much. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a good it's fun a good ride. Bit. Yeah, it doesn't take itself too seriously. It's about this machine uprising. Um, and it literally starts off at like a big phone convention. And the guy literally says, like, don't worry, they're not going to take over the world. We have a fail safe. And then it instantly goes wrong and they can't do the fail safe. And it's like, oh, no, no, no. But it's the phone that he's talking to before he goes on stage. He's like developed this AI to the point where it's like they have full on conversations and they've got a bit of a relationship. But because he's made this new tech, he goes out on stage and he's like, you can get, you can throw all that stuff in the past. And he like, da like dashes the old phone, and she's mm -hmm. like, "You dick!" And so she hacks everything and just fucks everything up. Mm -hmm. but it's just really simple. It's really fun, um, and the the whole world are watching this Mitchell family as they take on all these AI robots and stuff. It's 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 a good it's a good laugh. It's good. How do the how does the world watch them through like the cameras around? Um, so, <laughs> the way that the rope so to get around like killing. 
the robots have captured every human on the planet and they put them in this little in little boxes and like stacked all these little boxes onto basically like a massive spaceship that's just going to go into space forever and just never <laughs> just let them all die up there. Good plan. It, they've all got Wi-Fi, so like they're all they're, they're entertained while they're in there. So they're all sat in their little pods like. Like watching shit on YouTube and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's the uh, it's the prequel to Wally. Oh my god, it genuinely could have been a little bit mad. It's not a Disney, but yeah, no, it's it's very similar vibes, but at the same time, it's like super slapstick and it goes silly so hard sometimes. But it had me rolling. I mean, without a big spoiler, the mum who's Maya Rudolph, um, you guys, you know her, right? She's so <laughs> fucking funny. She um she just goes full anime at one point, like because this one robot and like they're like these big tank robots that come out and like you're like oh shit like how are they gonna get around that and one of them takes her son and like captures him and she just goes mental she just becomes like <laughs> she becomes yeah. this crazy anime killer and in the end all the robots are like run she's coming <laughs> and she just comes in like none of you survive. <laughs> Yeah, I've seen that scene. Oh, it's so That's really well animated as well. Actually. Yeah, it really is. It's, it's definitely got that Spider Verse uh, mm-hmm. kind of vibe to it. But yeah, re- really, really good fun. That's that's my one. That's one. What is it on, by the way? What did you watch it on? Uh, Netflix. It is on Netflix, isn't it? Cool. Yeah. I'm gonna. You know, what? I'm forget. That. I'm gonna watch it as I was. Need to watch that properly because I because I'm pretty sure I've watched that first scene that you were talking about at the the conference. But I don't know anything that happens in between that <laughs> and, uh, the, and the fighting scene at the end. It, it's it's um yeah, trust me, chuck it on, you enjoy it. It it had me laughing so much. It's just so silly, but we love silly. Yeah, we're all about silly. All about silly. <laughs> like reality is a very fine line. Like there is that silliness where it's not too silly, but like okay, this is just stupid. And there's silly where it's like, you know, it's, it's, there's a clever silly. You know how silly to be and the joke to make or the point to make. So I like, mm-hmm. I have a lot of respect when a film gets silly, just right. Especially when it's like a children's one that can serve adult. It's almost like, a, like I always said, I think the best balance I ever saw was like something like Shrek, the first Shrek. Perfect balance mm-hmm. of kids and adults. Perfect balance of silly and satire. Yeah, it's like a bar, isn't there? Yeah. It's a bar. Yeah, it definitely doesn't hit uh adult humor as much as shrek shrek was super <laughs> how they got really away with that it, it was like, <laughs> it gave, it, gave it to you all it was like you know kids won't understand it but adults definitely will and they'll be sitting there like oh, you can't say that <laughs> <laughs> crazy crazy times but um, yeah i guess at this point it would be a good opportunity to take a break if we can have an ad break, break this one so yeah we will add break and we'll be right back Go- Oh, we're not going to be back. I want to go. Back to mach- I want to go watch um, Mitchell's first machine. I'll be, I'll be back. Oh yeah, let's let's each watch a film and then come back. Let's yeah. each watch each other's film and then we'll come back. Okay. All right. So see you guys in about an hour and a half. Wait. Okay. Hey everyone, we're just taking a moment here to let you know some more details about the podcast and the direction we're going. We wanted to let you know that we now have a Gmail account where we would love to hear from you, connect to you, and get to know you all just a little bit better. So if you have any questions or comments that you might have, please don't hesitate and get in contact with us at rjopoddy at gmail.com. That's rjopoddy at gmail.com. That's right, Rikesh. Another way to get closer to the poddy is our amazing but highly under-advertised Instagram page where you can find a collection of our funny and silly ads with visuals for your entertainment, as well as updates on the poddy through our Instagram story, and where naturally you can also message us there as well. Find us at Red Jacks on Podcast on Instagram, and we hope you enjoy. Lastly, we are having plans of developing the podcast, extending outside of our hobbies and getting closer to our own individual passions. For me, being a trained therapist, my passion as well as profession is to help people, connect to people and share any tools and techniques that may be helpful to yourselves. And so, to bring the podcast and therapy world that little bit closer, I'm planning on creating an additional Agony Uncle style podcast to the Red Jackson family, where you can send us any mild to moderate issues and challenges you or someone you know may need any advice or guidance on where myself, as well as the boys, and any special guests can help and advise you and delve deeper into the therapy world. 
So please message us on rjopoddy at gmail.com as mentioned above and let's begin. If, however, you find yourself or someone you know in need of more specific, dedicated, one-to-one long-term help, then please contact me directly at sirhanavctherapy at gmail.com. That is S-E-R-H-A-N for November, A-V-C-I, therapy at gmail.com. Or find me on the counselling director around the Sirhan Avsi as mentioned. I hope to help, I hope to guide, and I hope to empower you all. Please find all the relevant details in the description below. I hope you enjoyed and possibly found a new way to get involved and for all of us to connect further. And now we've taken enough of your time. Back to this amazing episode of Red Jackson. Welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. Oh, I really enjoyed that film. That was a really good film and advert. Yeah, I really enjoyed that very uh, uh, good film about machines and time and <laughs> There. And Dracula. And Dracula was there. Nicolas Cage was great. Stellar performance from Nicolas Cage. <laughs> he was continuing to say, go, it's the machines! And I'm like, oh, calm down, bro. <laughs> calm down, bro. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. I'll face it. <laughs> right, right. Frank, what's, your, what's your next one? So my next film, um, I'm pretty sure that you guys have seen it because I think I made you guys sit down and watch it at your house. I think it was Chaz. So um, have you guys watched Code 8? Oh, my God. Yeah, that was Spielberg, right? Spielberg's one. Was that the right one? Code 8? Uh, no, I think you're thinking of District 8. Oh, District 9. District 9. No, that's not <laughs> that Spielberg. That comes after. <laughs> that's a sad fact. <laughs> Um, <laughs> code yeah, I think we did watch Code 8 together Yeah we did But man do I not remember any of it So Code 8 came out in 2019 uh, It stars Robbie Amell And Stephen Amell It's about um, It's about a society where 4% of the population have Superhuman powers But most of them live under the poverty line And it's it, the whole world's like policed By like drones and robots and stuff um, and it's about one guy. Uh, what did they say his name was? They're gonna do a heist. Yeah, they did. They, it, it's a heist film, <laughs> basically. Yeah, yeah, no, it's coming back. To it's really. It's, it's one of those films that really my brain just went, nah, don't worry about it. I let it go. But as you're talking, yeah, I'm a, like, he's 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 basically. He lives in poverty with his mum. Um, he goes out to find work every day. Uh, he, he works on like so like you can't work on a site and use your powers if it's not regulated and stuff like that uh, and then one day he gets sort of picked up by this group to to do a heist because he's got like electric powers uh, and then it kind of spirals from there he gets into sort of the, the underground um, and they pull bigger and bigger heists I believe until one day like they the drone police get involved uh, and then he ends up bringing down one of the drones because he's like he ends up being super powerful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember the drone. I remember him taking on the drone. Yeah, yeah. I'm really Stuff. struggling to remember anything else about this film though. Like, I, I think I might have passed out. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's too much for me. It's too much excitement. <laughs> I think that yeah. kind of says enough about our participation. It's no offense. <laughs> it was a forgettable film. It was. It was. Yeah, it's it's one of those another one where like you know stuff is happening, but like you don't really get invested, I guess. But yeah. the world itself and the whole concept of it all is is really interesting still, um, because you know you got these these people that have superpowers, but again they're being subjugated, and it's like quite grounded, um, and it's more character driven. Um, but yeah, it's 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 pretty cool in that sense. Mm. You don't okay. you really see a lot of like the drone police about like the whole thing about it being called Code Eight is that when a person uses their powers uh, and it's like to harm someone or to commit a crime, then that's a Code Eight, and then they just take them out. But take them out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's a cool idea. It is a cool idea, and I. I remember like not hating it, but I've just forgotten it. I've just 
got older. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, it did come out a while ago. But I did see when I when I searched on Netflix, it was they've got a Code Eight Two coming out or Part oh. Two. That's what I was googling. It. it was like whispers of it, like mm-hmm. like it's literally on on Netflix. Like not yeah, to I... watch, but it's on there. It's on there. All right. So Code Eight is a standard film. But Code 8 Part 2 is looking to be a Netflix-made film. This is yeah. what the logo on the top of it. I can see it. Probably not the same cast and stuff I'm getting. Possibly. It might be. It might be. Because the cast, the cast that they have, like I've seen them in other films, but they just it's one of those actors where they just quite haven't found that role to really break out or establish themselves. But like they're yeah. recognisable, but not like, that's the guy, that's that role, that's that person. Yeah. Yeah, I think probably Yeah, I think he's been in a few things. Mm-hmm. The Witcher. Yeah, he's been, he has been in some big films. Series mm-hmm. of unfortunate events is where I know him from. Yeah, no, he's been in loads of shit. Yeah, I might put that back on the watch list, mate. So I, I obviously need to rewatch it. Yeah, have a little, have a little watch. Nice uh, short superhero flick. It's pretty cool. Lots of different superpowers on display. Ones that are easy to film and animate. <laughs> <laughs> Did you say it was 2019 release? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, there was an initial, like, a, a short that you can find on YouTube. It's like 10 minutes long, which is which was like the concept of it that came out, I think, about four years before that. Um, and it was... It, it really like sort of shortened down shortened down the story so it has the whole thing of uh you got robbie amel and his his family in poverty he goes out to find work uh with his friend yeah with his mate um they have a problem with the foreman and then the drones called in and the, the police stop them and they go to arrest robbie uh, but then his friend pulls the policeman off and then the drones drop the robots and they, he gets shot. And then from that, he explodes his electricity and brings down the drone. So basically the main film expands on that and sort of has him go out and does bigger crimes instead. Right. So it's kind of like the, the, the short is more like setting up the world and the premise of the story. It doesn't mm-hmm. go anymore. Like poverty, work, drone, powers. Bin. Yeah, pretty much. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's respawn. I, I like the fact that you brought in some random two films that I've completely forgotten about, but my brain's almost like, yeah, oh, mm-hmm. yeah. I don't know. <laughs> that, that yeah. it's, it, they're cool. They're like gritty films, you know. They're like grounded. I think that's why, why I like them. It was, mm. was that season and that time, and I'm, they're still doing it now, where like, the odd superhero movies would come out under the radar without mm. being your Marvel and be like, let's just test the water because people are kind of interested in this right now. You know, sort of like Hunger Games inspired loads of book adaptations and uh, you had something like, I don't know, another random one like Hancock, for example. Another like, yeah, I sort of film and it's testing mm. the waters. Um, oh, Hancock would be a good one. I'm not gonna Chronicle. <laughs> Chronicle, that's Chronicle all. Chronicle was dope. Yeah. Uh, was dark i remember me and rick sat down we've already watched it i think as a group and me and rick went sat down to watch it at mine and edham was with us and i was like what, what should we watch i was like let's watch this superhero film and we sat and we watched it and we forgot how dark and serious it is and afterwards edham was like i'm not mm-hmm. expecting this and i was like i'm sorry man it wasn't a little like marvel disney dc vibe it was very like it like it goes into mental health before like yeah. mental health was a thing yeah and 100%. He mm. was messed up. Like, uh, like Michael B. Jordan's in it, like before he was yeah. even more. Fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I watched that film three times at the cinema. I was I was obsessed. I think like, I, I've literally got it on Blu ray. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why. It's, I don't know where it comes from. The moments in Chronicle where they're like moving shit and like they mm-hmm. learn to fly, like the way it's shot, it's just. It's, and the whole it's fan really footage good. kind of it's shot. Really, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it looks so real and it looks like actual teenagers who have just got this ability. Like, it's so real. It's fun. Apart from at the that, at the end, they kind of throw it away, don't they? Like, the whole everything being shot through a camera. There's a couple of scenes where it's just literally a cameraman, <laughs> I'm pretty sure, filming. No, I think because the... Um, are you talking about right at the end with, when everything's... Yeah. 
they've got a lot of like uh, helicopters flying over and stuff and all of a sudden it's like super hd like it's like mm. an actual film quality and it does throw you out a little bit but it's like oh i guess it's the helicopter footage but it, yeah it's like cinematic photography. it's weird <laughs> that it throws you out yeah yeah and footage but you see a proper cameraman from hollywood standing there looking yeah. like <laughs> this would make a great film <laughs> yeah it's just his side job you know when he's not shooting a hollywood movie he's in a helicopter doing police chases do you know do you know what is the the probably the scene i think that got us all when we watched it it was you know when they're driving and the guy's flashing the lights behind yeah. them and he just goes he just wipes them off yeah. i think I, I think all of us were just like oh shit yeah that film so deep oh. hours it was one of those moments of like you know, and sometimes we'd all do it where you're like, you you know, especially me and Charlie used to do it, we'd just do a pizza hut and look at our glass and not even drink for about six minutes because our hands would be there and we're like, I can do this, I can do this. And then, then it would be like, okay, what if one day I do see a car and I'm like, eh, woof, with my hand. And it's like, doof, crashes yeah. out. Oh my God, I'm you did that for like a whole term, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> Matt, I still try and move things with my, with my mind now. <laughs> I've been fully committed to in my life. I did my bed and I'm like, no, no, the next five minutes I'm dedicated. I'm going to tap in if there was any potential power and I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait this shit out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. Right. Do you want to go again, Sirhan? Yeah. What, what other three films do you have this time? <laughs> <laughs> but actually, what I have is <clears throat> this, what I wanted to do show and tell is because I was, I was really thinking about shows and there was a couple of shows I'm watching, but nothing too I want to mention. I'm actually gone back into reading at the moment. And oh, books. Fucking books. He had to, <laughs> I it's love gonna be, It's going to be a therapy book as well. Like, yeah, have you guys, have you guys read Dr. Schmickles? <laughs> 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 it's a female therapy book. I read enough of those in my own time. But uh, no, so this is a book. <clears throat> so this is now my favorite author, like hands down. His name is Carlos Ruiz Zacon. He is a Spanish author, which unfortunately has now passed away. Um, oh. But his books, and I have to give credit with her, she's written in Spanish, and his books have been translated into English by Lucia or Lucia Graves or Graves. I'm not sure if he's sure the pronunciation. And he's written four books. And what I like is uh, in this particular uh, collection of books, it's called The Symmetry of Forgotten Books. So they're all set in the same universe, they're all set in Barcelona just at different times. So they're anything from the 20s, 30s, 40s, up to like the 70s and 80s. Usually around the sort of very similar characters or like the main characters may pop up in the next book. So mm. they're a universe, but they're about different stories. They're all mystery books. Uh, really fucking well written. I've only read three out of the four, but the one I want to concentrate on is one called The Angels Game. It's because this book came out around 2008. And let's say I read it a couple of years after that. So it's been over 10 years ago I read this book. Loved it. And you guys know like anything, any game, film, book, movie show that you've watched so many years ago and you think, I loved it. And then sometimes you watch it, it or sticks. listen. And then it, it can, you can look back and you're like, eh, you know, that song was good for me at that age or it's actually really bad and I just didn't understand my standard yet. And I reread that book. I refound it and I was like, this is still my favorite book. I still love it. The language, the story, and not even realizing that was part of like a quadrilogy. But this particular book is about um, an author, is about sort of a writer that he's sort of, not a failed writer, but he's not kind of finding any, any like real success. And he finds out that he's got a tumor um, from the doctors. I think this, this particular part of the book is set in the 20s and 30s. And he's basically contemplating his life and he, finds this author, this random author finds him throughout his life and he's like, look, I want to hire you as an author. He's like, all right, cool. He goes, I'm going to pay you this much money. I'm going to pay you a fortune's worth. And he's like, all right, fuck it, whatever. Like, I'm writing already shitty books for these people that are taking my money, taking part in Jimmy, I'll write it for you. And you never kind of understand who or what this character is, but he's a bit supernatural. He could be the devil, he could be a demon, he could be an angel, but there's something supernatural about him. And throughout the book, he basically has this vision or this dream where he goes underwater and this thing takes the tumor away from him. Um, and what this guy wants him to write, he goes, I want you to write me a book. I want you to create a new religion for me. I want people to have... Just a small ask. 
Mm. A small ask, but it's really fascinating about when he goes and breaks down other religions and what makes a religion a religion, what makes it a story, what makes it people, basically what are people willing to die for? And because at this stage, he had a human he was going to die, I was like, fuck it. If you're telling me you're going to create wars out of this and create a, a cult and, a, and a, a religion and a following, then I'll do it. And as he, the, the tumor sort of mysteriously goes away, um, his consciousness starts to kind of kick in. And even the house that he's currently living in was owned by a previous author that may have been uh, connected to this particular demonic thing. Mm. And it's about his consciousness kicking in. And it's about him basically trying to like, destroyed this manuscript but also being haunted by this guy uh the love of his life has gone with his like best friend they can't be together he's got this other friend who's really like she kind of falls in love with him but she's too young to be with him he sets her up with someone else and you go for all this thing and basically at the end of the book he's basically just kind of he's kind of moved away to an island and he's kind of let she left his whole life in barcelona um his love of his life has died and the, this demonic guy who hasn't aged today finds him again. Is like, well, I'm going to give you your final blessing and your final curse because you, you know, you kind of screwed me over by not giving me the manuscript. But I like you as a person. And this sounds like a strange twist, but he basically gives him back the love of his life, but as a child. So it's like you're going to raise her, but you're going to die before her. So you're going to kind of, he's going to kind of see is. It sounds really strange. Yeah, you proper cur- That's deep. <laughs> he just cursed him. That but, is a curse. That's not a blessing at all. <laughs> no, it's not a blessing. Not like- but he basically brings her back to life. Mm. But the, the twist of the book is not that that book is not enough of a twist. When I read the other book and you start to read about like his best friend and her point of view, the twist is basically she starts to write about him. And as a reader, I'm like, now I don't know what to believe. Is one half of the book is basically telling you that, no, what he was saying was right. There was this sort of supernatural intervention and everything that he saw was real and he was the only one that knew what was happening. But his best friend was like, no, he was having a mental breakdown. Like, this was a hallucination. This was all in his mm. head about this mysterious person. But you never see him. You never meet him. And I think he needs to go to, like, a psychotic hospital. I think he's losing his mental health. So it's like, are you reading about someone having this mental breakdown with this tumor and all of this, or is there really something that did happen exactly as you read it? And that was just supernatural and crazy. Rob, it is amazing. It is my mm. favorite, favorite book. I am on the third book now and I'm reading, and it's, it's nice because it's one of these four books that you can read them in any order. There's no specific order, but you can read them. They're out. just connected. They're all connected. So it's like, now when I'm reading the book, this book is set, after one of the stories I've read, but before another. So as I'm reading this book, I'm like, oh, this, this, for this particular character, someone brand new now, it's like, oh, this person's going to be your best friend. This person's going to be your wife. This person's going to become evil in the next Do book. they all have um, mm. supernatural no, no, and that's aspects the, to them? No, that's the thing. That's the only book so far that's had an inclination of supernaturalism. All the rest are much more grounded. Mm. There's a mysticism in it to a certain extent, and they're all based upon, basically, there's the cemetery for God is this underground cavern underneath Barcelona. In every book, they always say, we don't know how long it's been there, but it's all about forgotten books, that people take forgotten books, and it's meant to be this maze of books that people, like like book owners, shop owners, uh, like massive readers, like people passionate about books themselves, that go, and especially, especially in Barcelona, it was based on a lot of real-life politics. I don't fully understand a lot of wars, a lot of political changes where people were burning books as they do mm. in war and it's about all these books called being hidden away in the cemetery of books and this is sort of the underlying connection between all of the story and the characters are like this person's like this best friend or this person's this sorry excuse this word like this bastard son like he doesn't know that this was his dad so it's all of these this web that finally connects all of them. But when you read each book, they're so finely focused on each character that you kind of, you don't need to forget, but you don't need to focus on every other character. But it's so, it's one of the few book, like, collections I've read, and I'm, like, Googling, like, who is this character? Oh, this is the mum of this person. So that means this, in this book, this, she's still a young girl. She hasn't met this guy. So this hasn't happened yet. And you really have to, like, puzzle it together. It uh-huh. doesn't over <clears throat> It spans like generations and stuff. <laughs> it sounds fun. Fifty six years, mate. It, it's it's hands down my favorite book is The Angels Game, and it's my favorite collection. And I'm halfway through 
now one called the the shadow of the wind which is quite highly acclaimed um and it's, it's those books that i can read it for ages mm. you don't yeah. read it fast, it mate you sold the story the story is actually solid like it's something i've never really heard of before i like the idea of the first one with right in the religion and there being like this weird thingy around it yeah no that sounds really fun actually to be fair when you started saying about books i was ready to switch off and uh, you kept me you kept me listening so fair play <laughs> that was yeah, no, when when warner brothers picks it up i'll watch it yeah yeah oh no not when warner brothers picks it up anyone else please <laughs> please warner brothers please don't. it'll be warner brothers <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's ruin it. film in these uh it's kind of sad for me because the guy uh, the author died quite young in his 50s from cancer so i'm like his full potential was never really met and i know the books but he is definitely my favorite author and even the translator the language i love words bro i'm always googling words i've got my own little dictionary on my phone of words that i just love and i'm like so you know when someone explains something to you and they use big words but not for the sake of sounding smart or using big words it's like mm-hmm. no, but perfectly describes this thing that in the understand. perfect context in the perfect context so it's not like overdoing it it's like no it's just perfectly balanced in its language and presentation it's, it's accessible but smart enough where i'm like oh that's a fucking banging way of, of explaining that um and he i I'll end it on this the author put one sentiment in, in all of his books which is whoever writes a book and then reads those books especially if you have a, a like a, a recycled book or book a second hand book it inhabits a little bit of the soul of the author and every person that reads it. So you're carrying on that part of themselves that they put within the book. Absolutely. This is, I was thinking about the books in the book and I'm reading a book about it and I'm like, oh mm. shit. Yeah. This is, this is really deep, especially knowing he's not alive anymore. I'm like, I'm really am carrying on this sentence. That's, that's actually really cool. That's really, really cool. Yeah. So if you're in the mood to read, um, <laughs> yeah, I would, I would. Well, what, his books, his that? books are also on Audible, on Audible, so oh, you can listen good. to them as well. Go for it, go for it. if you can, yeah, go for it. I think to listen to them would be awesome as long as you've got someone uh, entertaining enough to read them to you. Mm. Mm. Oh, fair play. So how many, how many books was there in that collection? Three. Let, four. In this collection, four. there's. Four. Yeah, I've only read uh, two and a half out of the four. I'm half. So you, you've brought seven things to the to the table today, then. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> You had one. You, you only had two jobs, sir, and you made it. In. I was like, let's make this a nice short, like one hour podcast. Two little subjects each, you know, little blase. No, Sahan brings seven. Here you go. <laughs> it's the Sahan show. <laughs> I, I know you guys would appreciate it. Uh, no, it honestly sure. sounds really good. You, you hooked me. You hooked me. Right, well, that's all we have time for. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be the one who was like, Go I've got, I'm on such a time limit. Um, I'm just going to, have you guys seen Cars? Yeah. Oh, yes. Here we go. Love yeah. It. So, <laughs> I like Cars. I, I've, I've always enjoyed Cars. And I finally committed to watch Cars 2. Yeah. I was like, okay, there's a two and a three. <sighs> let's watch, let's watch Cars 2. <coughs> Sorry. So, we put on Cars 2. And I have no idea what Pixar was doing because it's the worst fucking thing I've ever seen in my life, right? <laughs> Shit. Like, all the characters are there, but bearing in mind, you're kind of there for Lightning McQueen. Like, he is the Dorothy of that what, universe. You're following him. He's barely in it. It's all about Mater being some kind of super spy. This is literally me just shitting on Cars 2 because I then watched Cars 3 reluctantly. I was like, what's the fucking point? Cars 3 is really fucking good. It's really, really, really good. And it's about uh, Lightning McCre- uh, McQueen's retirement years, which then instantly was like, well, that's so fucking annoying because I wish we had a better film for two to see Lightning McQueen doing really well and like enjoying his career. You know what I mean? It, it kind of done a Toy Story 1 and 3, but if Toy Story 2 was just about Rex, you know what I mean? It yeah. was so fucking... It it's definitely me was off. a forgettable one, yeah. It's ruined the whole trilogy. Mm-hmm. But one and three are amazing. It it, it kind of... I, I remember watching this. I don't know if I watched it at home at the cinema, but <clears throat> Cars 2 felt like almost like a Christmas special that you get on Disney sometimes. Yeah. Like, it's fillery, but if it's like a little half an hour short, it's, it's justified, but you don't need to make a whole film about it. Because, yeah, it really was... For the flow of the story of the trilogy, it was really off-key. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. It was all about Mater. And it, yeah, it was very strange. Whenever it cut back to Lightning McQueen, I was I actually like was into it a little bit, and then it goes straight back to Mater, and it's like, ah, oh, don't fucking care. <laughs> I think that's why they basically cut him out of the whole of the third film. It's just like a phone call, basically. But it, overdosed so him in the second film. Yeah, it's such a shame. But yeah, that's my that's my piece. I just wanted to get it off my chest more than anything. Pixar, come on. <laughs> it, it definitely scored worse out of the three. Oh, okay. uh, we're looking at forty percent on Rotten Tomatoes, uh, whereas Cars One got seventy four and Cars Three got sixty nine. Nice. Hey. <laughs> yeah, Cars Three is good. Have you seen Cars Three? Yeah. I don't know. I don't think so. It's the one where like new tech cars come in and like he can't he can't keep up anymore, so he like goes to the super training thing and it's a good watch, mate. Like, it's a really good watch. I was doing it on my Pixar binge and uh, yeah, it was good. Didn't yeah, they do? I don't think I have, you know. Aeroplane one as well. I, yeah, they have. Was Planes an official Pixar release or was it like a short? It's official, I think. I'm pretty sure it's in cinemas. It says, yeah, look at it now. It's Disney planes. Literally the oh, same thing, yeah, but it's just in planes. Why? Come on. Watch, <laughs> bring it to the next hotel. Watch that next. Yeah. Well, they, they're both, they've got planes and they've got planes, fire and rescue. And both of those came out in between cars two and three. Wow. And they're both like official religion. I, yeah. Never they both bombed. Yeah. Well, planes, planes bombed. I am sure of the planes is like 5.7, which is better than Cars 2, but it's 25% of Rotten Tomatoes. So. Mm. <laughs> well, the thing is, in Cars, there are planes, like and helicopters and stuff. Yeah. yeah. So why would you need to have a whole thing called planes? It's like, no, we, we already invested in the cars. It's like doing Toy, between Toy Story 2 and 3, having a film that come out called Tools, and it's just <laughs> tools talking to each other. <laughs> We've, already, we've seen it. It's okay. I want, to, I want to see Woody and Buzz. Not fucking... Mm-hmm. I don't know. Fucking mold Do you know uh, what was good? The um, the Cars PS2 game. Yeah? It's pretty Ooh. good, yeah. Based on the first <laughs> film. Uh, oh, P- yeah, it was on PS2, it. yeah. On PS2? Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, it was pretty, that, but... pretty good for a driving game, racing game. And uh, pretty faithful to the movie as well. Sweet. So if you're Lightning McQueen, you just instantly win. Well, this game came out in two thousand, <laughs> and it came out PS2, Wii, GameCube, and PSP. Mm-hmm. What the hell? I know they made PS2 games for a long time, but two thousand and six in my mind does not compute with PS2. That would be like PS3, right? Two thousand six. Yeah. Um. No, I think it was still PS2 back then, right? No, so PS3 released November 2006. So that was the last, one of the last generation. One of the last, yeah. And yeah. they probably were still supporting PS2 for maybe at least another year after that yeah. or something. Yeah. Oh, no, they did. They did. Yeah. But yeah, no, it's a pretty solid game, I would say. Stretch. Sorry. I'm going to give you a string now. That was fun. I like that. that was fun. I think I like this new segment or, or this new uh, thing. I like the show and tell. Every once in a while, we should all just bring a little something, something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's always a surprise. I do have a a, a final question. <laughs> can you can you guys make either some kind of link or some kind of theme between the um between what you brought to the table today? What we brought ourselves. Yeah. Animation. Oh, just for ourselves, yeah? You, you, you only watch animated stuff. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> yeah. Far off the truth. That makes sense. Um, I am willing to take risks. Because a book is commitment. Uh, <laughs> and Nicholas Cage is also a gamble on both ends. I'm like, I'm, I'm being the most open-minded I could be. Genius or terrible. And I took a gamble with both. And <laughs> I think my one is... Basically, don't you don't mess with a mother's boy because you don't know what they're gonna do. <laughs> Both the films I picked start off pretty much the same. It's like a guy who lives with his mum 
and then something happens to his mum, so he goes on a rampage. Goes bad, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In a sort of super utopian thing with this guy with electric powers and a watch on his arm. <laughs> they confused him together. <laughs> Code time. We are new sort of ad break for this particular. One. Don't mess with the mama's boy. <laughs> <laughs> mama's boy returns. <laughs> Part two. <laughs> yeah, cool. Nice one, guys. You guys know that, that was fun. Yeah, it was good. We've had because I, I don't want to say it, but maybe because yeah, it's been so smooth. There's been no issues. <laughs> say that again. Yeah, I mean, we, you have been quite quiet for a lot. Of oh, time. sorry, sorry. I'm just saying, like, don't you find that this has been one of the most smoothest like podcasts that we've. <laughs> I wonder what the reason is. Hmm. We can't, we can't, let's not do any promotions for the My most <laughs> most enjoyable podcast so far. Hmm. <laughs> this is the formula. Oh, oh, do you know what? I thought it was because of the different software we're using, but I get what you're saying. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a good friend. I, I didn't go to Rickett straight away. Wow. No, I met Rickett straight away. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as we get Rickett running next week on Skype, it's great. Hey, guys. I. <laughs> Damn it, Rickon, he's just got a button that controls your Wi-Fi in the house. <laughs> yeah. He just goes, so what's that? <laughs> on, on, off. You, 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 I'm you. Uh, okay, bro. But yeah, no, nice one, guys. Um, yeah, yeah, thank you, listeners, uh, for joining us again on another episode of Red Jacks On. Uh, I've been Fraser. I have been Charlie. I have not been Rikesh, but I have been Sirhan. I can I, I, I endeavor to try. Could be I could be Rikesh, but I don't want to be. <laughs> uh, yeah, but uh, thanks for listening. See you on the next one. Let's know what you've watched in the comments. Oh yeah. I like that idea. Do it. Do it. If there's anything we should review, yeah. As well, message us uh, and message us how much more you enjoyed an episode without Rikesh. And <laughs> if more positive than negative, we'll just chuck him out for you guys. You know, this is this is payment. The only message Nick, we Nick, get is from Rick. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, Nicholas Cage, if you want to join us on the show, just let us know. Yeah, big shout out to Big Nick. Uh, come down, join us. Good house, old Nick. house. Big Nick. Big, big, big Cage. Nick. You know. Oh, Big Nick. Yeah, good old Cagey. <laughs> the big scene. <laughs> That's just Rick. <laughs> Sound like this. Like, oh my god. I'm gonna try and AI it. <laughs> it's cheap though. Alright. Cheers. See you in the next one. See you in the next one. See you in the next one.